Okay, 5.30 having arrived, I'll call the meeting to order and we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, first item of business is the tax warrant, which... I believe we have it in here, John, or signatures. Okay. Cemetery lot applications. Okay, and this is the tax collector's warrant, the property tax levy for the state of New Hampshire, and I would just note that the Board of Selectmen uh, did indeed come in and sign this. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll read the significant portion here. In the name of the state, you are hereby directed to collect the property taxes in the list herewith committed to you amounting to the sum of $6,618,788.50 and with interest at 8% per annum from July 17, 2009 <coughs> and thereafter on all sums not paid on or before that day. So if there are any further questions. All good here. Back in the correspondence file. Okay, next on the agenda, and we can get to you uh, well before six o'clock. Um, if you could actually move to the table and the microphone, okay. and uh, give us your name and. Okay, so is this on by default, or do I need to do? It something? is on by default. <laughs> okay, so hello everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Jeff Garnis. I'm a professor at the at UNH in the Department of Natural Resources and the Environment. Um, and I am studying, among other, th other things, insects that affect our forests here in New Hampshire and beyond. And one of the things that I study most intensively is the emerald ash borer. I I'm, I'm going to assume that most people have heard of this insect and are relatively versed in sort of what it, it, it stands to bring to our communities, unfortunately, which is uh, lamentably uh, a lot of dead ash, <laughs> yeah. especially in the larger uh, age classes. But what we've been pursuing over the last number of years is in my lab through a number of students, in, including Bree Aflag, who you've been in contact with, I know Andy, um, it, it, who just finished her master's degree and will be continuing on with a PhD, um, thankfully, uh, to help us solve these problems, uh, is uh, using biological control agents and, and specifically asking questions about how the biological control agents function in our landscapes and uh, the potential for controlling the severity of the, of the damage by emerald ash borer. Um, and I won't go into great detail about the, about the parasitoid complex that have been released because the focus of this project is actually on the trees themselves. Uh, and we, we intend to study what's called ontogenetic resistance, which is a mouthful, but um, it basically means how resistance to insects or pathogens changes over the age of a tree. So big tree, big ash trees are highly, highly susceptible, pretty much without exception. There are maybe a few lingering ash trees that we're seeing that maybe are, uh, have, harbor some resistance, uh, but mostly 99% of trees are, are going to succumb to the ash borer. Um, uh, in the smaller tree cohort, however, there seems to be some level of resistance, but what we don't know is whether this is just physical resistance, like thickness of bark or um, just the habitat that the insect experiences, or if it has to do with the chemical signature of the trees. Um, that does tend to change over the age of a tree and across a lot of tree species. So this is a very common phenomenon, but we don't understand it in this system. Uh, so what we would like to do in this uh, experiment, and it, uh, this involves four sites across New Hampshire along the advancing edge of the emerald ash borer invasion, because we don't want to study it where it hasn't gotten yet, of course, because of the potential to introduce it where it hasn't yet gotten. And we don't want to study it in the Aftermath forest, we call it, where everything's just devastation because the populations are too high and we've lost a lot of the trees already. So we're sort of restricted to this band of the advancing front, and Deerfield is one of those places. Um, and two of the sites that we intend to study are green ash and two are white ash. And Deerfield, right across the street at the ballpark, there happens to be both. Green ash below the ball field, uh, d down by the conservation area, and then uh, white ash up above. So it's sort of ideal from that perspective and also ideal because it contains that range of size classes of trees that we're interested in, basically from, I use centimeters, but 
three centimeters about a little bit more than an inch, so very small trees, all the way up to about 15 centimeters, about six inch trees. So we're talking about relatively small trees um, and, and not too, too terribly many of them either. We need 48 trees per site and that's across all of these age classes. So um, equally distributed in um, three to six, six to nine, nine to 12, and 12 to 15 size range. So that, in other words, the biggest, tre the biggest trees, there would only be a t 12 of them per site that we would be needing to, um, to uh, utilize. Uh, really, in terms of from your perspective, um, especially the bigger trees, but eventually the littler trees too, will we'll succumb to this uh, beetle whether or not we uh, study them as it happens. So in, in a sense, uh, taking out the bigger trees is going to maybe save you even a little bit of maintenance in terms of um, not having to deal with hazard trees that are lingering on the property that ash tends to kind of crumble as opposed to fall down uh, wholesale. So it's a little bit less dangerous from that perspective, but it's also, it can be a hazard. Um, so just briefly a little bit more about the experiment itself. Uh, we, we have, uh, we want to institute three treatments and two are relatively benign. Uh, one is just a control treatment where we do nothing. Another is um, what's called an inducement treatment, which is where we take um, a plant hormone called methyl jasmate and apply it to the tree. And that um, initi it tricks the tree into initiate, initiating its chemical defensive cascades. So it, it tricks the tree into thinking it's being attacked. And uh, we can then look at the chemical signature that results from that you know, uh, pseudo attack. Uh, but the third treatment, which is the most complicated from your perspective, I would imagine, is we want to actually see what happens when the emerald ash borer attacks these trees. So in the third treatment, this would be 12 trees per site, a total of 24 if we consider the deer field to be two sites, depending on your approval, of course. Um, we would actually apply emerald ash borer eggs to the tree, uh, and that's done by ordering up eggs that are produced in the Michigan Rearing Facility, which uh, there's a, quite a big APHIS facility that... Um, APHIS is the Animal Plant and Health Inspection Service uh, that, that rears emerald ash borer in order to be able to rear its parasitoids, its biocontrol agents. So they send us eggs. We, we very carefully um, check which ones are viable and then literally tape them to the trees and cover the, uh, the, the bowl of the tree where the eggs have been placed with this Tyvek, um, you're familiar with Tyvek, uh, you know, building material that keeps the rain off, basically, because if they get wet during their initiation phase, they'll, they'll die. So for a short period, maybe four to six weeks in June, July, there would, uh, there would be 12 trees per site that would have um, this Tyvek tent placed over the trees, and then basically nobody would really be able to tell any difference between those trees and, and, another tree, and any other tree in the forest. And again, we're talking about small size class up to about yay big. Um, and then we would come in and harvest the trees in about October. And uh, the reason that we do that is because we don't want to let any of our experimentally infested trees produce any adult AE, uh, emerald ash borer, EAB is what we call it. And the <clears throat> minimum time for development from egg to adult is, is one year at a very minimum. And then usually it even takes longer than that, up to two years sometimes. And so by taking them out within the same season in October, we would be effectively removing anything that we brought to the site. Um, additionally, we would also be releasing parasitoids, which is something that would most likely be done anyway. Um, Bill Davidson at the Department of uh, Forest and Lands at the state of New Hampshire um, has been releasing uh, a suite of parasitoid wasps, little tiny wasps. Don't sting, don't bother anybody. Probably too small for you even to notice they were there. Uh, all along the advancing front throughout New Hampshire. He's done a really good job of establishing these populations. In order to study how um, our treatments would affect these wasp populations, we would also release them. But those would have the effect of suppressing emerald ash borer densities at the, at the site, if anything. Hmm. And so, sorry? <clears throat> so I don't want to go on and on. And I, I think maybe the best way to manage this is for uh, just answer any questions. So. Um, uh, I'll just close by saying uh, that we did quite a lot of scouting throughout this advancing front um, and in, in collaboration with uh, Bill Davidson, who I just mentioned, I uh, found these two sites. They're particularly attractive to us because they're the right size and the right numbers, and they're both green and white ash. So it would be, from our perspective, very convenient, but of course there are other sites if there are, if there are considerations that are beyond uh, you know, my control that, uh, that influences your decision. But 
Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about our concerns. What, what do you need from us to get going? Permission. Nothing, just permission, really. I mean, uh, we, would do, we would come in, uh, if, you, if you were to grant permission for us to do this, we would uh, walk with as light a footprint as possible. You know, we would need to tag the trees at the base just so we could find them again. That's how we make sure we don't leave any behind. Uh, we would probably do some flagging just to be able to find them easily. And then, uh, you know, our field crews would be coming, you know, maybe as much as once a week, maybe not quite that often, once every two weeks to take various measurements. And then we would do a final harvest in October. Um, and, and then we would peel the trees at the, uh, we, up until now we've been using the Bosquin Plant um, State Nursery for our peeling party, we call it, uh, because it's quite a lot of work to peel all the trees and count all the emerald ash borer larvae and all the parasitoids. Um, but that it would, they would be removed off site. The only thing we would leave behind, and this is not, uh, this is negotiable if it's a problem, but we, we typically leave the tops behind uh, just because it's easier to do so and they haven't been infested, so there's no risk. But if it's, um, if you prefer them to be removed because they're unsightly or for whatever reason, then we can, we could certainly do that. Tell us where it is. Yeah, and I think the information that Bree gave us uh, had a, a schematic of exactly where this is. This is sort of down over the bank from the ball fields across the road here, headed where the conservation land abuts the uh, town-owned land on the backside of Bicentennial Field. Right, exactly. As you walk down that conservation trail, the Lindsay something The trail. Lindsay Flanders Lindsay. Trail. That's it. Uh, right pa as soon as you get past uh, the, that little ramp that goes up to the backside. home plate, basically, uh, that's on both sides of the trail, there's a fairly um, restricted area where you find the green ash. Uh, and if you go too far, you're into hemlock, there's no more ash, so it's really right there. But kind of, uh, you know, it wouldn't upset anybody that was at the ball field, you know, anybody, we, people might see us if they walk their dog on the trail, but, you know, we wouldn't be in a place that was bothersome to anybody there. And the site that I'm, uh, I didn't get a chance to scout as much as I was hoping to, I got here a bit later than I wanted to, but is right um, across the street uh, adjacent to the parking lot uh, on the top side of the ball field. So that's the white ash site. So they're not exactly mixed, but they're sort of separated. I think I mentioned to Bree in a uh, conversation earlier that um, we've got some uh, ongoing COLSA projects from UNH right now um, on town property, both uh, on land uh, and in streams um, under the direction of Sarita Fry. So this is certainly uh, nothing new. Mm -hmm. I think there's some significant benefit to figuring out how to get a handle on the emerald ash borer. It's great. Yeah, how, do you, uh, how do you apply the, this uh, material that makes the tree think it's under attack? Uh, yeah, methyl jasminate. Uh, we um, use a, a cotton, uh, we basically pay, tape cotton that's uh, soaked in methyl jasminate. It's just, a, it's, a, it's a plant hormone. It's, uh, it's used to ripen fruit and do all sorts of things. I mean, it's a common compound. Uh, and we just we literally soak it and, and attach it to the bark, and it soaks through the bark surface. Oh, so you don't have to apply it underneath under the bark. No, it's right through the bark. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, the only thing I'm not sure where you were, you're talking about behind the backstop, and we were talking about a project with the town to work that take care of that erosion, and they were going to cut some trees down. So we may want to hook you up with the town road agent or whoever's doing that work to. Right. Make sure we're not cutting the trees down that you want to yeah. study. Yeah, I would appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, if it's if that uh, if that project is going to go forward this summer and it's too difficult to manage, then that would probably make it so that the site wouldn't be useful to us. So we really need to know that in advance. But I'm happy to do the groundwork and speaking with whoever I need to speak with. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't think that uh, it would probably negate your project, but okay. I hope not. But yeah, I was trying to look at the map you had sent us here. Right, uh, yeah, if you see in the, in the, white, the white rectangle there is a little hard to see unless you printed it in color, but literally right behind the backstop. I think, I think, um, I think that's a little generous with how, how, how long it is. Uh, to me, it's, it's more wide than long, but um, I didn't draw the rectangle. It breathed it, so I don't yeah, know. Yeah, the work they're talking about doing is behind that other backstop. Okay. If you're looking at the map, it's over to the right, that, but, the, the hill it drops off there, so. Okay. Uh, yeah, it would be great to connect with, with somebody just to know exactly where they're talking about. Yeah. Just uh, for my information, uh, the 
The mature uh, ash trees, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what appearance does it, uh, does it appear on the, to the tree itself being attacked by the, uh, by the borer? How, how does it appear? Yeah. Uh, you mean how would you know or how does the tree know? How would I know? How would you know? Uh, well, unfortunately, it's actually very hard to detect it in the early stages of infestation. Uh, what you usually see is woodpecker damage. So the woodpeckers are keen to find these larvae that live underneath the bark. And uh, usually in the second or third year after they become infested, the winter after that second or third year, the, the woodpeckers just start going crazy. And they, uh, they pick off the bark, and bark, ash bark comes, comes off in little flakes. And underneath, it, uh, it's, it's kind of yellowish. And so we actually call that blonding. So when you see your tree start to exhibit blonding, and there's evidence that woodpeckers have been doing that, then... then but unfortunately, at that stage, it's pretty late. To catch it before then, uh, you can look at canopy dieback, and, but there can be a number of causes for canopy dieback, including another disease that we deal with in, uh, of ash. Uh, so it's a little hard to know. Uh, if there's a particular tree you'd like us to look at, we might be able to, to help. But. I was wondering if the uh, trees on, uh, on Church Street up yeah. near the top of the hill, whether those yeah, are Yeah, Moore's Corner. Yeah. Those things are. Oh, that's road salt or emerald ash borer. Right. <laughs> it's hard to bunch. say. So there's also a phytoplasma, which is a, a disease that's vectored by little leaf hopper, little, little tiny insects uh, that, that has been affecting our ash for some time. So it could be ash yellows. It could be just road salt or root compaction or something. Who knows? Um, like I said, if you'd like us to take a look at specific trees, we might be able to diagnose it a little bit better. Uh, if you're interested, there are uh, chemical treatments that you can use for high value trees. Uh, it's up to your, it's at your discretion, of course. I mean, some people prefer to just remove them or wait until they die naturally. Or if uh, there's a chemical called emamectin benzoate, which is a root injection that um, is, protects the tree for up to four years. So it buys you some time. I mean, depending on how many trees you have that you want to protect, it can become expensive, but the price has actually dropped. And it's relatively um, ecologically friendly, although we're studying that as well. Um, this year to, to sort of understand how it moves through the ecosystem. I was going to say maybe if you got a chance to uh, go out Church Street at, at the top of the hill at, or as you approach the top of the hill, uh, the trees on the right-hand side. You won't uh, miss it. Sharp curve. You can't, you can't miss them, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. Well, I don't know what the pleasure of the board is. I think, uh, you know, other than uh, maybe discussing which trees we were going to remove for the erosion control project, uh, other than that, does the board have any objection to... Make a motion that we full steed ahead with. I just don't know what to say. Is it U N H or right? Second. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So um, we would appreciate it if you could touch base, probably uh, through the town administrator, John Harrington. Okay. Um, to d just make sure that uh, our erosion control plans and tree removal aren't removing the trees that you're looking to study. Okay, excellent. And I, I would also uh, mention that thank you to Nick Lawrence, who actually Bree first contacted um, <coughs> Nick about this uh, because it looked like a Parks and Rec site, and uh, and Nick referred her onto the board. So mm -hmm. that was uh, where thanks. it started. Thanks for coming in, Jeff. Very informative. Okay, thank thanks. you. Thanks very much. Okay, next on the agenda we have Nick Lawrence, and this is in regard to Parks and Rec van surplus. At least I think it is, Nick, right? That's one of them. Got, uh, I could actually start with something else. Um, sure. So we have... Uh, I'd like to start by uh, first publicly congratulating um, a local senior high school student that uh, approached me, uh, his name is Forrest McKenzie, and he was um, selected as the Gatorade New Hampshire Boys Cross, Crunch, Cross Country Runner of the Year. Um, so just a little bit about that. Uh, the Gatorade Play It Forward initiative works in conjunction with the Gatorade Player of the Year program uh, to empower student athletes to provide resources to sport organizations in their communities. Um, through the Play It Forward program, all 607 Gatorade Player of the Year award winners, which Forrest was one of, um, have the opportunity to select youth sports organizations to receive a $1,000 grant uh, to help the next generation of athletes uh, reap the benefits of sport. Um, so Forrest chose the Deerfield Parks and Recreation Department, so on behalf of the department, uh, I would like to thank Forrest for the 
uh, generosity of the donation and then wish them the best of luck in the future. Um, and then just ask for your blessing to accept that donation as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, could we get a motion to accept the donation? From the so moved. Second. Okay. We've got a motion and a second. Further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Consider it accepted. I would note, too, that uh, Forrest is actually going to UNH uh, on a running scholarship, so you can still see him run if you right. <laughs> desire without too much trouble. Is Jim around? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, so secondly, uh, the van, uh, the red uh, Ford E250 van is what we're talking about. That was our utility van. Uh, is no longer of use, as some of you know already to us. Um, won't cur currently pass inspection. Uh, needs rear quarter panel work and fender well restoration as well. Um, I consulted O'Neill's in town about this. And, uh, you know, right out of the gate, he recommended that it probably wouldn't be something that was able to be done. Uh, to pass inspection, uh, making it you know virtually useless to the department going forward. Um, so I did call five out of uh, I called five body shops, um, and all five of them did state that they don't perform that type of work on on vans uh, with the amount of rust that's on it. Um, so if, with that confirmation, um, I did go ahead uh, and submitted the uh, the form here for sur surplus property disposition request. Um, with the fair condition value through Kelly Blue Book, um, which, you know, if you look at the van, it doesn't seem like it falls under fair condition, um, but the values are there. Um, you get tw about 2500 in private sale value or 1500 in trade-in value. Um, but I'm just looking to see what the board's recommendation is with that van moving forward. Yeah, well, I think uh, having had a look at the van and understanding that we're not going to get it uh, inspectable, for anything less than <laughs> what's listed here is fair value, um, which I, I don't think it actually meets fair condition criteria. That we probably want to surplus it, but I don't know what the rest of the. Yeah. Yeah. It is, the question is, well, how do we surplus it? Is it over a thousand or under a thousand? Right. Yeah. Well, it's up to the board, I guess. Because we had talked like about proceed? putting it out on the street with a for sale sign on it to see if someone in town might want to use it. Typically, <clears throat> we would we would accept sealed bids or, or right. something along those lines um, for it. But I mean, that's been what we've done in the past with vehicles. So. Mm -hmm. If it's, I don't know what the board's pleasure is. We still put it side of the road, right? With a make a bid. Yeah, make sealed bid. bids. So, yeah. Accepting sealed bids. And, uh. Before you vote, could I just say that they trade. The high schools, the boys do work um, for towns or schools or whatever. So you got Concord, Manchester, Exeter, that maybe they'd be willing to do the work on it and you could use it again. I don't know. Um, so what's the board's pleasure at this point? You want to? Definitely surplus it. What? Start by putting it side of the road with a with an invitation for accepting sealed bids. Let me put something on the website with it too. That yeah, and picture up and any advertising we can do that, and we need to you know set a deadline for the sealed bids. Right. And we want to have a reserve minimum on it. Having been through this a few times before, I know that the oh, yeah. high sealed bid has sometimes been like two hundred and twelve dollars. Fifty or, bucks. Yeah. <laughs> um, we want to say subject to a five hundred dollar minimum, or I think that's a good yeah, yeah sure. Like that, just a is this unsafe or is it just cosmetic? Uh, it's mostly cosmetic. It also needs exhaust too, so that's another piece that comes off of it. So yeah. my town might like it. Yeah. So is the board in agreement? that we'll move forward with uh, accepting sealed bids for the surplus of the van? Yes. yes. And I guess, John, you can you could set whatever time frame you'd uh, cut off date for that. <clears throat> Will we have to replace this? We've been currently using our uh, passenger van. So basically everything that we need to do, we can just hook the trailer up for, whether it's for big events like Old Home Day. We've been getting by without it, so. Okay. So say we haven't used it for Months. Six months. Uh, yeah, it hasn't been inspected since last September. Okay. 
All right. Um, just quickly, uh, is that all you had, Nick? Yeah. Um, this isn't on the agenda, but if there's no objection from the board, uh, Mr. Paul Pindris is, is here this evening and wanted to um, talk briefly about the use of the town hall for contra dances. And if there's no objection from the board, rather than... Sure. Uh, We're good with Nick. Are you good, Nick? I'm all set. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you giving me the time. Um, the, uh, there's been a, a monthly contra dance in Deerfield for going on 30 years. I'm not exactly sure how long, but it's, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 years. Um, I myself have taken over operation of this dance for the last uh, four or five years. Um, <clears throat> This year, uh, in talking with uh, Ray Ellis, uh, he told me that there were going to be some new guidelines as far as using the hall. Uh, we use the upstairs, and we have always used the upstairs hall. Um, apparently, the fire chief uh, has put restrictions on the number of people that can be up there because he's concerned about egress from the building in case of an emergency. Um, while I hope to increase intended, attendance at the dance. I understand his concerns because I'm a former firefighter and, and, and I wouldn't uh, buck what he requests. So he, he's limited to 40. Uh, we've been running between 30 and 35 dancers, so I think we're, we're well within the guidelines. Um, another stipulation that Ray shared with me was that uh, he wanted to um, reserve the hall on a month-by-month -month basis and I explained to him that in, in uh, operating this contra dance, I really need to do it uh, up to a, a year in advance because there's the matter of uh, making arrangements with bands and callers. Um, and there's other contra dancers in southern New Hampshire that are in competition for, for talent. And, uh, you know, if I don't get on, on people's schedule, um, I, I just won't, won't be able to, to do it. Um, Apparently, John has agreed that it's okay to, to do it a, a year in advance, and, and um, you know that works for me. Um, the third thing, however, that that was uh, recently shared with me is that John asks that uh, we actually become a, an official nonprofit organization. Uh, when I first took over this dance, I, I'll say about five years ago. I actually did apply to the state or, or contacted the state, uh, and they sent me the packet of information. In looking it over, um, it was going to be tough for me to do, uh, primarily because I am the, the sole operator of this. I wish it wasn't that way, but I'm in a situation, I'll, I'll say, of the, uh, like the story of the little red hen, uh, where everybody likes to go to the dance, but nobody wants to help out. So. I'm the chief cook and bottle washer. I do just about everything. Um, and so it, it, as far as establishing a, a, a nonprofit organization where the state requires that you actually have officers on, on your board, um, I would put my name on, on every category, and I don't know how that would fly. And, and I don't know that I want to take on that kind of uh, bureaucratic paperwork um, I do this on a volunteer basis. Uh, I'm retired now. Everything I do is volunteer. Um, as an example, I was the last editor of the communicator in town before the funding group Focus uh, pulled their support. Um, this, is, this is another thing I do for the benefit of the town. Uh, I make nothing uh, in the way of, of monetary remuneration. Um, any money we take in goes back to the bands and the callers uh, at the end of the evening. So if, you know, I understand how uh, from a standpoint of, of, of dotting I's and crossing T's that John may want me to, to show that we truly are a nonprofit, if, if that's really going to be required, I'll just walk away from it because I, I really don't care to take on that kind of a burden. Um, it's, not, it's not why I'm in, in this uh, from the get-go. So, I mean, you can tell me which way you want to go, you know, whether you, 
you actually really want that or you know can we can we forego it i think probably um I think we can certainly get you a decision. Um, I think that we would more likely, um, we're going to want to talk to John and Ray um, before we make that decision, which we can do fairly quickly. Um, I will say that, you know, I'm certainly familiar. I haven't been to a contra dance for a number of years, but I moved to Deerfield in 1989, and there were active contra dances and went to a number of them. I will. I also have recollection that uh, the early contra dances um, helped raise funds for the restoration of the upstairs. So I would feel somewhat remiss if we push the contra dancers uh, out from the, the tradition that has certainly spanned 30 years and actually helped pay for uh, the renovation in, in some capacity of the upstairs. Um, and it, it's, uh, contra dancing is a tradition that goes back to the earliest days of colonial America. And uh, once when I moved into Deerfield uh, several years ago, it, it's part of what uh, made it attractive to me to live in this town, uh, you know, part of small town America. Um, that and editing the town newspaper, um, you know, I was really, really felt like it, it made me a, a part of the community. And, and well, uh, give us at least another meeting. Um, we'll, we'll get some information about uh, concerns that John have and Ray have, but, uh, you know, I think speaking for myself, obviously, but uh, I certainly don't want to run the longstanding contra dance tradition out of town if we don't need to. Can I ask why he has to be a nonprofit? You can. <laughs> <clears throat> the, the request was not that he has to become a nonprofit. If he wanted to pay the nonprofit fee, he had to show proof that I w he doesn't have to. To become a nonprofit. We oh, okay. So there, there might be a, a communication yes. breakdown between. Right. There was no request that you become a nonprofit. That's but you indicated to Ray that you were a nonprofit, and that's when I said you'd need to show the documentation. Well, okay. Then I think there was a communication issue. Yeah, very definitely. Yeah. Very definitely. So said, give us um, give us another meeting. Um, we'll talk with John. We'll talk with Ray, and and see if we can up with something amenable for you. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Okay, next up we've got uh, cemetery maintenance bids and recommendation from the trustees, which is this in correspondence, John, do you think? Do I have it in my folder, actually? Transfer. Thank you. Okay, we have recommendations from the cemetery trustees. This is from Dana Vanderby. Uh, the cemetery trustees would like the town's approval to award the 2019 cemetery maintenance contract to Tyler Partridge at TNT Landscaping. As you can see from the attached bid comparison, his price was much better than similar uh, competitors. We also took into consideration the fact that TNT is a Deerfield company and is already familiar with our cemeteries. Please let me know if you need anything else, Dana. These were the bids that we referred uh, to her. Um, TNT was 11,800. The next closest bid was 17,000. This is May through October, cleanup mowing of uh, Old Center Cemetery, Fellows, Sanborn, Haynes, and Parade, as well as spring cleanup and fall cleanup. Yeah, and John, do you have more? Um, as the last page is the actual agreement from Tyler that he dropped off today, and you'll see that that price is uh, lower than the original bid. After discussing, the cemetery trustees took out a couple of cemeteries, so his cost went down. Okay, I'm looking... Oh, that's just mowing, okay. And the very last page is his actual agreement, and that's 10800 I believe. Yeah, the, okay, because I'm looking at the 18000 Right, 10800 That's what it's going to be. Yep, that is his final price. We need a motion for that. We do. Make a motion we allow award the bid to TNT, Tyler Partridge, 10800 for 2019 cemetery mowing and cleaning. Second. Motion and a second. Discussion or questions? Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, it appears to be unanimous. And John, uh, there's a signature page on the 
quote, no place to sign. And I would just sign in the body of the agreement. Okay. The other one has the old numbers, so. Okay, review of outstanding minutes. Make a motion to approve the discretionary preservation easement barn plan for May 6th. Second. Okay, we've got a motion by Dick and a second by Fred McGarry. Discussion? Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. 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 And we also have the minutes from the selectmen's meeting that followed the discretionary easement hearing. So moved. Second. Okay, we've got a motion by Dick and a second by Fred again. Discussion, corrections? Yes, Jeff. I have one correction line 57 on the first page. Yep. Um, I think it should be Selectman Schutt stated that just to be clear, money for the mowing of the fields would come out of the Parks and Rec revolving account. Okay, so noted. Any other discussion? Hearing none, those in favor? Right. Aye. Aye. Vouchers and payroll. Payroll manifest in the amount of $73,359.47 with a net payroll of $49,284.77. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Fred, a second by Jeff. All those in favor? Aye. 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 being signed I would note that a quorum of uh, the board signed the accounts payable manifest from May 13th 2019 the total amount of sixty two thousand one hundred fifty three dollars and ninety three cents Have an accounts payable manifest with today's date uh, in the amount of forty-five thousand three hundred and twelve dollars and twenty cents. So moved. Second. We've got a motion by Jeff with a second by Fred. Discussion. Hearing none. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, moving to signatures. Our first order of business is a cemetery lot application. This is from uh, Mrs. Regina Bowler, uh, looking for one lot in the Old Center uh, Cemetery uh, in consideration of $400. And we need a motion and a second. So moved. Okay. Second. We had a motion by Dick and a second by Fred. Discussion? Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, 
Okay, and we have a large folder from the assessing office that we need to go through, and there's a little bit of a new format on the timber use tax, so bear with me if I start stumbling. <laughs> Okay, the first order of business from the assessing office is uh, current use uh, change tax collector's warrant, and this is in the amount of $610. It is for uh, Amy Smith at 379 Courier Road, and we need a motion and a second to collect our tax. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Dick with a second by Fred, and there are two places to sign on this. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Next, we have a recommendation from our assessor to deny an abatement. Uh, the abatement was applied for by Lisa and George Thorne. Um, property is at Forloon Ledge. Uh, the Thorns are of Hooksit. We need a motion and a second with regard to the abatement denial. So moved. Second. We've got a motion by Fred and a second by Jeff. Any discussion? Um, Avatar attached a fairly lengthy explanation of why they would recommend denying the abatement. What were the names? Uh, the name is Lisa M. and George G. Thorne. And the Deerfield, there, as I said, they're of Hooksit, but the Deerfield property is at Four Loon Ledge. So, discussion? Uh, hearing none, those in favor of denying the abatement? Aye. 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 Those opposed? I don't know if there's a place to check here. Apparently not. Set those aside. So I've got two timber tax levies that require a motion in a second. Um, actually, I say too, this is the change. Uh, we're listing a number of them with a number of places to sign. I believe this is a paper reduction attempt on uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sherry's part, but I'm going to read the names on the first batch of timber tax levies. Uh, this is uh, Charles Huckins, uh, timber tax due 835.22. Melinda Gettys, timber tax due $1,977.92. Anthony Plott, uh, $96.36. Roscoe Blaisdell, $11.75. And I would need a motion to go ahead and levy the timber tax and collect it. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Fred with a second by Jeff Shoot. Discussion? Yeah, $11, what is that, cutting down one tree or what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I know the $96 Cash. is cutting down a couple of acres. <laughs> <laughs> um, all, those, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, I missed one. And there are a number of places to sign this. <clears throat> I don't know if this actually landed any of here. I'll pass it. Okay. 
here's the first batch. I'm going to follow that with a second batch. This is timber tax levy, uh, the original warrant again. Uh, first name is Adam St. Germain, 23 Lang Road. Timber tax due, $19.65. Uh, the second is the UNH Woodlands and Natural Area. Uh, they are exempt from timber tax, uh, being part of the university system. The third is Tuck Core Real Estate and Development, uh, $420.17 is due. And the fourth is Kerry and Sarah Vose on uh, Middle Road, and $70.75 is due for a total of $510.57. So moved. Got a motion by Fred. Is there a second? That was Jeff. Oh, I'm sorry. A second. Motion by Jeff. This is a second <laughs> by Cindy. Discussion? Hearing none, those in favor? <clears throat> Aye. Aye. get away with just excellent it gives, it gives out on you okay I'm going to send along two notice of intent to cut wood or timber uh, forms that don't require a motion in a second uh, the first is for Molly Grant and the name of the road from which the timber is accessible is Middle Road and the second is for Charles and Cynthia Kelsey and this is uh, off of Woodman Road and Lower Deerfield Road on the Northwood line. Tax collector's warrant. Is this something separate? Uh, okay. I'll do I will break that out then. Okay, we've got uh, several other signature items here. We have a memorandum of, of agreement that's been submitted to us. Uh, by uh, Chief Duquette from the Police Department looking to apply for a Homeland Security grant for uh, radio reprogramming. Um, I don't believe this is a slam dunk, but the police chief would like to apply for it and needs the memorandum signed by the board. I think a motion to sign it. Okay, we've got a motion. Is there a second? Second. second. Any discussion? Is that a matching grant or is it a full grant? It's a full grant. Trying to see if there was an amount on it that he was looking for or thought that he could get. No, oh, he's just he's got the items listed, but there isn't a dollar amount with it. But isn't this only for the application and then you have the right to refuse it? Mm -hmm. We would. This is just a memorandum of agreement to move forward. Okay, there's one signature line. <coughs> Yeah, I think we probably do need a motion on this. So we've got a motion. Cindy second, I okay. didn't vote. Further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. 
Okay, we, uh, I have a request for a signature on a letter from Courtney Tory at the Lazy Lion Restaurant, and they would like to expand their business um, to the upstairs. There's one of the upstairs rooms over the restaurant. Um, the purpose of that expansion would be a painting and wine, as I understand it, primarily um, type setup. This is apparently fairly common that uh, you offer a program where people can have a glass of wine and get painting instruction or drawing instruction. Um, they have the space. Uh, they would like to get permission from the New Hampshire Liquor Commission to move forward with it and get a permit, but they need a letter from the selectmen uh, acknowledging that the selectmen are aware this is happening and do not object. So I'll move to give it a try. All right, we've got a motion by Dick. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> and a second by Jeff. Uh, discussion? Can they do it without handicap accessibility to the second floor? That I don't know, and I believe the, um, the permit that they apply for from the liquor department will probably address that. Hmm. What are they going to do for parking? Well, it doesn't say here. That's, that's my concern. Is there a second way out of up there? Is there a second egress out of? True. <laughs> Never I'm not exactly familiar with the egress, but I know that uh, there have been residential apartments there that have been approved for use. So uh, there is a fire escape on the back of the building, and there's also a stairway on the side of the building, the front of it, as it faces 107. It goes to all floors. What's the current use of the second floor? I believe it's been, it was being used as an art and writing space by an after school program. I'm just wondering if, uh, with the expansion of their activity to the second floor, whether they should end up going to the planning board for a site plan review. And this planning board would, uh, should address the uh, parking issue. Yep, we could certainly recommend that. Do you want to make our signatures contingent upon finding out if they've gone to the planning board yet? Yeah, I would. Uh, I'll add yeah. that to the motion. Yeah. Okay. So the, the just to clarify, the motion is uh, to support this if and when they uh, present their plans to the planning board and get approval from the planning board. Right. Other discussion? Or? Yeah, I'll go with that, Jeff. What do, we're just saying, yeah, we're okay with them using that? Yeah, I'll read the exact. Um, basically, when you apply for the uh, a permit to expand operations from the Liquor Commission, you have to have a letter from the Board of Selectmen stating that the town is aware of the use and has no objection. And our letter, uh, just see if she's getting more clarification here. Yeah, and she, she has received um, approval from the fire chief for the uh, permit to operate a place of assembly already. Um, and the letter reads, we, the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Deerfield, are aware of and have no objection to the use of the paint studio or of alcohol being served there. The studio is on the second floor above the Lazy Lion restaurant located at 4 North Road in Deerfield. And we're going to add to that as long as we get plenty of board approval. Yeah. That's the way the motion stood. Yeah. Door stands. Okay. And this is uh, any uh, establishments that that serve alcohol have to come to the board of selectmen um, in order to have music, in order to have dancing, in order to have exotic dancing, uh, <laughs> which is specifically spelled out in the RSA. So. <laughs> Uh, but this falls under that same thing. You have to have general endorsement. So, no further discussion. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. We will recommend that they approach the planning board, and then we can sign the letter if there's no objection from the planning board. Okay, we've got a personnel action request, and this is essentially uh, hiring Madison Thorne as a part-time lifeguard uh, for VZ Park. It would be a 32-hour week position at $12 per hour. So moved. And a motion by Fred. 
Cindy. Second. I'm sorry. A motion by Cindy. Or, or a motion by Fred with a second by Cindy. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, discussion. Hearing none. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. There's one. Signature line. Okay, uh, we have a request for naming of roads. Um, this is for 60 Ridge Road, um, which if you're somewhat familiar with Ridge Road, uh, where the power line is at the top yeah. of the hill on Ridge Road, this is a long dirt driveway that extends to the west. Um, you can't really see the house. The house is almost in the power line. Um, and they would like to apparently I don't know if this is involving a subdivision yeah the, the planning board had uh, granted them a, uh, a Smith ordinance uh, okay. approval I think there's only one one additional lot in there okay. well they, they'd like to name the the drive essentially leading to the subdivision uh, they've given us three choices choice number mm -hmm. one is mm -hmm. High Woods Road Choice number two is Hummingbird Road, and choice number three is McGrath's Motorcycle Ranch Road. <laughs> <laughs> this first one, high. high the first choice uh, <laughs> that they would prefer is High Woods Road. What's, what's our policy with regard to private roads? Uh, we still ask them to come to us for approval. I of mean, the as far there. as road versus lane or lanes are on the lake. Lanes, lanes are, are on the lake. Lanes okay. are on the lake. Um, okay. And we've asked that it have either relation to natural or historic right. um, values in the area. So it's on top of a ridge and it's got some woods. So we'll I guess a motion to go with their first choice. We've got a motion to go with High Woods Road as recommended name. That won't be too confusing with High Meadow and. I'm just asking. I don't know. I certainly like it better than McGrath's motorcycle race. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we could go with one, I guess. That's fine. I was just there is a hummingbird lane. thinking rescue. Yeah, I think fire. you're right. There is a hummingbird lane in existence already, so oh. probably right. well, highway so road is choice. better. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> can we get a motion? Give <laughs> me a second. Second. We've got a, a motion by Dick with a second by Jeff Shute. Cindy uh, likes the third choice. I <laughs> well, I know the significance of the third choice. When they have the dirt bike weekend that runs through Deerfield, they use their driveway and actually meet down there. You can still, there's still some little orange arrows going down their driveway. Huh? <laughs> so those in favor of High Woods Road? Aye. 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 Okay, appears unanimous. Farm. Okay, and we have an appointment form from the planning board, and this would be to appoint Bob Cody as a Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission member. Um, I have a copy of the minutes from the planning board where they voted to recommend Bob Cody as the representative to the Southern. New Hampshire Planning Commission. Make a motion to uh, approve Bob Cody. Okay, Fred uh, McGarry has made a motion to approve Bob Cody, which I assume gets Fred out of going to those meetings. I think I'm, no. I'm, I'm on there as well, I uh, think. Okay. At least I'm supposed to be. A second. Actually, I don't think you're up, Fred. We've got a motion by Fred with a second by Jeff uh, for Mr. Cody. Discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none, those in favor? Yeah. Aye. 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 Be unanimous. That concludes the signatures with one exception. We have a unique payroll manifest uh, page that needs to be signed free and clear of the regular payroll manifest and this is for $184.70. So moved. Okay, we have a motion by Dick. Is there a second? Good. Second by Jeff. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.
while you're signing this, I will get to the reason for the separate payroll manifest. And that is because it is the 10 year anniversary of Cynthia McHugh's service to the town as oh, animal wow. control officer. And I'd like to present Cindy with the longevity award and bonus that comes with that. <laughs> Correspondence. Um, I've already read that we signed the accounts yeah. payable manifest from the 13th. Um, and I guess I would turn to Fred because it's probably more new business, but it's in my correspondence file. And that is an agenda request form uh, from the Lamprey, the Upper Lamprey Scenic Byway Council. Um, and they are looking for us to appoint uh, new representatives. And I know, Fred, I think you were going to address this. Yeah, the, uh, we had received that request. And, and uh, we have, I guess, three, three uh, representatives that were supposed to be coming from Deerfield. And uh, the, the Upper Lamprey Scenic Byway uh, runs Candier, Deerfield, and, and Northwood. I don't think it goes into Nottingham. And uh, originally it was going to include Raymond, but Raymond thought there was some kind of a grand conspiracy of uh, having this byway go through. But anyways. We did too for a time. We did, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I would uh, certainly recommend that the uh, board uh, try and come up with three, three uh, volunteers. Yeah, okay, we can certainly put the word out. And there's not much information about the um, time commitment here. I served as your appointment once a month, three or four hour evening. Good. No, I certainly remember when you were on the board. You reported to us. Okay, we'll, we'll move forward with that. If you can uh, maybe make notice on the website. Mm -hmm. Okay, town administrator's reports. I have one item this evening. Uh, the highway road agent would like to notify the board that they have started crushing in the pit and they'll be working with Steve Rollins again this year. Thanks. Uh, Andy, are they on a four day week now? Yes, they are. Unfinished business. I don't know if uh, any board members have unfinished business. We have the Rainbow Bridge project listed. Uh, if there's no other unfinished business, I will jump to that. And mm -hmm. I guess would start by saying that um, I think we probably need to give these people a decision. Uh, we've had the public hearing, and uh, they need to know whether they should be approaching the planning board or not. Right. They um, have not, right? Do they have not? No. I guess I would say, uh, just to, to start the commentary, um, the only public comment I have heard has, has been not in favor um, of the project. And I guess I, I'm not as concerned about potential uh, damage to the neighborhood as I am a little bit concerned about uh, entering uh, sort of a public-private business relationship. But I'm not sure what kind of precedent that sets for the town, and I don't think there's enough revenue coming out of it to maybe make it worth the, the town uh, being involved in it. I mean, I understand why they're interested in the municipal property because of the, the landfill being permanent right. already, but um, I think maybe we open the door to other folks coming forward. And I don't know how the rest of the board feels, but. Well, certainly there's not a, a great deal of revenue, that's, that's for sure. Um. Uh, I, uh, 
certainly think that there is a there's a need, and I think we defer to, to Dick as far as the, the frequency with regard to uh, large animals that in town and the vicinity that may need to be uh, composted as such. Uh, the process that they've described and I'm somewhat familiar with uh, is if it's done properly doesn't result in any uh, any odors that would be emanating from it. Um, I know one concern that I that did come up to me anyways that was raised by why one of the abutters was uh, the infestation apparently of uh, rats that possibly leaving the landfill and I was wondering what what might have uh, might have caused that to occur and whether we as the town did anything to to try and uh, correct that situation like that's a that's a separate issue entirely um, so I'm I guess I'm somewhat sympathetic but uh, I can see your I can see your point as well with regard to granting an approval I'm familiar with the process, and if it's done correctly, it works very well. But I, as I said, I just I'm a little leery of um, the the town opting into an arrangement w with a private business, and I'm not sure that's going to sit well with everybody in town. And I'm also not sure that we're not opening up the door for other people to come forward and say, "Hey, we like the looks of that gravel pit, and how about you going into business with us?" or that sort of thing. Well, I was I was thinking that I I'm all for this process, but. After our legal counsel, they didn't understand it. And talking to people, it does smell. And for them to do a small business like they were saying, that's not going to be profitable for them. So I don't see how they can't bring more other animals in. It, I think it's just going to snowball. And I haven't been able to get the answer I was trying to get the answer for the uh, euthanization um, the chemical that's used chemical that seeps into the ground that seems to not go away um, where is that going to go after and I don't think we should put ourselves behind something that could come back and get us after either not for the amount of money that <laughs> mm. yep. okay so it's general agreement of the board that uh, we will tell them that we don't wish to have them operate on the town landfill property yeah I have no problem with the with the project on on private property but I agree with you as far as town property if they were coming to us with this for their own land or some land they were looking at I'd be in favor of it Jeff Did, yeah I think I've had a couple people just they just didn't like the idea of it um, so I, I, I think the idea is fine, but again, I'm, I, I think your point is, is good. I hadn't thought about that as to the, the agreement, so. Well, we should probably make a motion and, uh, and you know, something to the effect that uh, we're d denying the Rainbow Bridge project uh, proposal uh, as proposed. Involving town property. Yeah. Make that motion. Okay, we've got a motion by Jeff. Second. <coughs> Second by Cindy. There's no further discussion. And hearing none, those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, can you advise the Rainbow Bridge folks that we would prefer this happen on private property as opposed to town? Thank you. Um, new business. Other business of any kind? Hearing none. Uh, I don't believe we have any non-public uh, sessions this evening. So no. Turn to citizens' comments. I just Seeing that, make the meeting for the June third instead of the seventeenth for the next one. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think we definitely should, and then we can get back on our every other week schedule. If there's no comments, a motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Andrew.